First of all, like Molly said, um, I am a VP, Vice President and Academic Dean at the Milwaukee Public Museum. I'm relatively new to this role. Um, I started that position officially in May, which means I oversee the education, exhibits, collections, and research uh, programs for the Milwaukee Public Museum. Um, but before that, in my previous life, um, I was a research curator and um, director of the Pulicker Butterfly Vivarium and head of the zoology collections. Um, all that being said, my true love um, is butterflies and moths. And so I'm, I'm a lepidopterist, entomologist um, by training. Um, and so today I'm gonna tell you a bit about um, some of the research that I've conducted on butterflies and moths over the last several years. So this is a slide that highlights um, my research program or gives you a little bit of a, a flavor for what um, the research that I do looks like. Uh, most of my projects are centered around entomology collections, um, which means we utilize museum specimens and their data uh, to address a variety of questions related to insects and their evolution. Um, for the most part, as I said, I work on butterflies and moths, but I have also dabbled in projects um, related to beetles and flies, and I've had all kinds of grad students over the years um, that have worked on all kinds of different um, groups of insects. So um, a lot of this work is uh, looks like what you'd expect. Um, somebody out in the field catching bugs, taking them back into the lab and looking at them under the microscope, um, sorting and, and pinning material and and getting it into a, a drawer and finally uh, into a cabinet. Um, that said, a lot about museum science has changed um, pretty drastically over the last decade. And a lot of the work that we do um, now also involves um, chemical ecology, a lot of um, molecular biology, genomics, um, metabolomics, all the omics. And so um, in my program, now and over the last probably five years or so, we've we've done all of those. Um, um, we've we've dabbled in those approaches and, and those techniques um, in addition to the, more of the traditional um, biodiversity science um, that's that you can see in this slide. So today I'm going to be talking about um, some of our more current work in those areas, um, but I'm going to be focusing specifically on a group of moths uh, within the family Erebidae. Um, this group has uh, over 20,000 species uh, in this family. And so it's quite remarkable. Um, that's more species than there are species of terrestrial vertebrates on the entire planet. So we certainly have our work cut out for us um, in trying to learn um, as much as we can about uh, the biology and, and evolution and behavior of moths within the Arebidae. So why am I so interested in Arebidae? Well, um, besides the fact that there are um, more than enough species to go around in terms of studying. Um, this group of moths has incredibly divergent life histories. There are moths um, in this family that feed on toxic plants. There are moths in this family that feed on lichens. There are moths that pierce fruits with their proboscis or their tongue. Um, there are even moths that use that structure to feed on the tears of sleeping birds. Um, this is a, a picture of a tear feeding moth feeding on this magpie while it's sleeping um, in Madagascar. There are also moths that's, that actually pierce animal tissue and feed on blood. These are vampire moths. Uh, this is a vampire moth um, piercing through my thumb and, and feeding on my blood. That, that is my thumb in that picture. Um, we also have moths that, um, as adults, uh, use their, their proboscis, their mouth parts, to, um, to scrape away at the tissues or, or leaves of, of plants that contain toxic compounds. Um, they actually regurgitate saliva onto those leaves, and they make a little soup uh, with their tongue, and then they imbibe that fluid and gain protection um, from that plant. Similarly, um, some 
species um, that uh, exhibit that behavior will even um, feed on those chemicals that are stored in the scales of other moths that have died. And that is what we're looking at in this picture here. This is a moth that is feeding on um, another, whoop, that is feeding on another moth um, that had imbibed those toxic compounds um, from a plant. And so this is sort of a, um, a very remarkable uh, life history. Finally, there are moths um, in this group that um, have really interesting um, ability when it comes to producing sound. Um, there are moths in this family that, um, that produce sound to attract mates and to also um, uh, to evade predation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. There are moths in this group that are also really important to uh, agriculture. There are species that are both biological control targets and agents, uh, meaning that um, you know, some of these species can be pests uh, of crops. Um, this is a, a very famous crop pest, um, especially in the old world tropics of countries like um, New Zealand and, and even Australia. Um, these moths will pierce through fruits and fungi, uh, fungi will um, and other microbes will infect the holes that, um, that the moths make uh, in the fruits with their mouth parts. And um, it actually causes rot and early drop um, in a lot of fruits. And, and some of these moths will, um, will cause damage that results into up to 90% loss um, in, in crop fields. Uh, on the other hand, um, we have moths that are uh, that have been brought in or introduced um, to control um, plant pests. And that's the case here with Tyria jacobi, which is the cinnabar moth, which was uh, introduced uh, into Europe to control uh, ragwort population. Finally, there are many species uh, in this family that are model organisms for studies in chemical ecology, um, insect host interactions and behavior. Um, this is um, a picture of a fruit piercing moth. We've been um, using it as a model species to understand um, how fruit piercing moth might transition from uh, a fruit piercing behavior to piercing an animal host and feeding on blood. Um, this is a lichen moth um, species that we've been studying to try and better understand um, why a, a caterpillar might feed on a lichen. As you can imagine, lichens are very, um, very rough. And uh, thinking about that as, as a diet, uh, as opposed to a nice juicy plant um, is, is kind of a, another interesting transition um, that, we're, um, that we're heavily focused on. And finally, um, the species here, Bertholdia trigona, uh, is a model organism for understanding how moths can use sound production to evade predation by bat predators. And I'm going to be focused on um, this species and its relatives for a large um, portion of today's presentation. So just kind of tying uh, all of this backstory together, um, you know, my research program within Lepidoptera um, is really looking at uh, the evolution of these behaviors and of um, these traditions. And so I uh, am very interested in addressing questions about um, how these species make these kinds of associations with the things that they feed on. We think about what things eat. Uh, it's very important um, across the board, really. And so um, for me, what's driving a lot of, um, of the research that I do and that my students do is just trying to understand um, you know, why these organisms and, and how they become attracted to those hosts. How do distantly related organisms form these associations and why? And hopefully in gaining knowledge around how these associations are formed, uh, we can help um, address grand challenges um, when it comes to food safety, security, and even um, zoonotic uh, disease transmission.
so there's another group of organisms uh, within the the Arebidae. Um, I, I talked a little bit about um, Eudicema tyrannus, the moths on the left here. And, you know, these moths are, um, they're notorious uh, fruit piercers. And uh, I already mentioned that in the old world, um, they can cause up to 90% or more loss uh, in, in some agricultural areas. And this group in particular is actually known um, to attack 50 different kinds of cultivated fruits. Uh, we don't see this um, species here in the United States. We don't see um, very many fruit piercing moths um, really at all in, in the United States, um, except for in the southeastern US and, and in parts of California. Um, but through my research, I actually, um, I actually found um, this species, Calyptra canadensis, which occurs here in the state of Wisconsin, um, we, we found caterpillars, enough caterpillars and, and eggs um, to rear this species in colony and actually observe it piercing on fruit in the laboratory. And so this um, image here on the far right is an adult Calyptra canadensis moth. And you can see it's got its proboscis um, here in the strawberry. And, um, and so this was a, the first record of uh, a fruit piercing moth actually piercing fruit, not only um, for the state of Wisconsin, but also for uh, the species. And so um, in thinking about um, fruit piercing and how um, and why uh, these moths um, obtain their nutrients in this way, um, we were actually uh, able to um, determine that this type of behavior um, has different, uh, different levels. So we actually have, um, we have moths that pierce fruits like the strawberry that are actually uh, pretty soft uh, and don't have uh, a very thick skin at all. Um, and we also, um, you know, through surveying the literature and, and other field observations have found um, that moths like these on the far left are able to pierce through very hard, even in some cases, uh, under-ripened fruits. And there are, other, um, there are other moth species that can feed on softer but thicker skinned fruits, um, such as citrus, uh, in the, the southeastern United States. And so we're seeing all different kinds of, of degrees of piercing, you know, as we examine more and, and more of these species. We also know that there are some fruit piercing moths that are what we call secondary piercer, fruit piercers. And those are moths that further penetrate a wound or a hole made in a fruit um, by some animal or bird or even a primary fruit piercer, um, such as uh, these two species that, um, that I'm showing you here today. A little bit of a, a lag on my advancing the slide. Sorry about that. There we go. Sorry. Okay, here we are. Now, through these observations, um, we also found that some fruit piercing moths actually use that piercing tongue to pierce through animal tissue and feed on blood. And those are vampire moths. And so um, this is a, an example of a vampire moth, Calyptra thelictri, and it's um, feeding on me. These moths occur throughout South and Southeastern Asia. And over the course of this work, we've determined that 10 of 18 subspecies uh, species uh, described are actually facultative blood feeders. And so what that means is they will feed on, um, they'll pierce skin and feed on blood that they will also uh, pierce fruits to take nectar. And so this is um, really remarkable. This is the only um, genus or group in all of Lepidoptera, so almost 200,000 species um, that pierce both fruit and, um, and mammal skin. 
And so there are a couple of different theories as to how these associations may have evolved over time and how these different types of fruit piercing may have transitioned into blood feeding. And one hypothesis um, says that, um, you know, these moths potentially uh, were hitching a ride on animals similar to lice um, and then maybe um, engaged in skin feeding, uh, wound feeding, and finally um, transitioning into blood feeding. And the alternative hypothesis suggests that uh, the blood feeding habit arose from um, plant piercing um, and that followed by accidental skin piercing, um, culminating in, in uh, behavior that involves piercing animal tissue and feeding on blood. And so one of the things um, in my lab um, that we've been studying for a long time uh, within this greater context of trying to understand moth associations with plants and other hosts um, is uh, we were able to um, gather enough data about these moths and how they're related to each other uh, to test um, whether or not that blood feeding evolved from a plant associated feeding behavior, which was a hypothesis put out there um, by Dr. Hans Banzinger uh, versus um, an animal associated feeding behavior. And um, the reason I wanted to put this slide up here um, was to also illustrate that um, it's often the case that feeding behaviors or defensive behaviors um, or even mating behaviors can be associated with a particular type of structure. So structure, it's not always the case, but can in some cases be associated with function. And so this is an illustration showing um, the difference in structures uh, between a piercing, uh, a, a skin piercing and blood feeding mouth parts and those that just, um, you know, pierce through maybe a soft skin plant uh, versus um, uh, mouth parts that are just um, used for maybe taking nectar or maybe um, are not functional at all and just are um, sort of uh, uh, vestigial structures. And so Downs was the scientist that put forth the idea that um, skin piercing and blood feeding in um, these vampire moths evolved from animal associated feeding behaviors. Certainly there are many other types of, or many other moth species that feed on different types of hosts. I mentioned the, the tear feeding moths. This is a butterfly feeding on, on animal dung. Um, this is a butterfly feeding on roadkill. So certainly um, moths in general are associated with animals when it um, comes to feeding and obtaining nutrition and, and ions and, um, and salts and things like that. Um, so we built a tree um, that was comprised of different species that have associations with both plants and animals. And with this family tree, we mapped these different types of behaviors onto this tree. And when we build these family trees, we, we build in an assumption um, that the species at the base of the tree are older, represent older lineages over evolutionary time, and those at the tips of the trees are more recent radiations. And so there is some directionality that we can infer when we have a family tree, um, as we say, that has fruit piercing species, tear feeding species, blood feeding species, nectar feeding species. And then we can use that tree to say, well, which of these behaviors um, um, arose at what time along this evolutionary time scale. And so what we determined with this tree and the species in it and the behaviors mapped onto it uh, is that blood feeding or the vampire moth lineage arose here. And this lineage is in fact, most closely related to other species that pierce fruit. And so from that, we can deduce that the blood feeding in the vampire moths was a transition not from an animal associated feeding behavior, but a plant associated feeding behavior. And it's truly remarkable in the first time, um, you know, something like this was, um, became known to science. So it's very exciting. <laughs> 
And so this is um, a study that I conducted uh, as part of my dissertation research and um, into my postdoctoral um, research. Uh, but I wanted to provide this context um, as we now transition to talking a little bit more uh, about tiger moths. This is sort of the way in which we investigate the evolution of these different behaviors and how um, these species might be related to each other and whether or not um, their, their structures and morphology um, have any sort of um, correlation with um, what they're feeding on and how they're doing it. So that kind of covers one half of the Arebidae. I said there were 20,000 species in that family. Um, and so roughly half of those are fruit piercing, blood feeding, tear feeding moths and their relatives. And roughly the other half are tiger moths. Now, usually if I was giving this talk in person, I would say, raise your hand if you thought these were pictures of butterflies and other insects that are actually not moths at all. And I have to tell you that most of the people in the audience would raise their hand and say, these cannot be moths, these have to be butterflies. Um, well, I'm here to tell you today that these are tiger moths. They're an absolutely um, brilliant and charismatic um, group of moths. Uh, you can see many of them um, do mimic butterfly species. Uh, many mimic um, different species of wasps and even stinging beetles. So I mentioned earlier um, that within the Arebidae, we had some really interesting um, species that were used um, as model organisms for studying various behaviors. And I mentioned the species Bertholdia trigona, and here is another picture of it. Um, Bertholdia trigona is a species that has been used to understand sound production, um, both sound, um, reception and production, I should say. This is a species that um, has a very interesting um, system when it comes to communication, um, especially with bats. Um, you can see here um, a little bit, hopefully, under the forewing, there is a structure called a tympanum, and that is the ear, the moth's ear. And that is how moths are able to, um, to hear um, bat echolocation when they're flying, they can actually receive those sounds in the night sky. And actually, all moths have some sort of tympanum or structure for receiving um, sound. Um, many insects do. But what's really interesting and unique to um, tiger moths is that not only can they receive the sound, but they can also respond to it. And they respond to that sound um, by making noise with these structures here called timbals. And I'm going to play you a little video. I hope it works so you can see um, and hear uh, what, this, um, what this structure can do and, and how this works. Now it's going to be slowed down a little bit. So um, tiger moths have muscles that are attached to the underside of that bubble. And when those muscles contract, um, that is when you hear that sort of rippling effect. And then when the muscles relax, you actually hear it again. Um, it's, it's kind of like, um, I think of a, like a bag of, of potato chips where you crumple it up and it makes a sound when it's crumpled. And then as you let go of it and it uncrumples itself, you can also hear a little bit of sound. And that's kind of how timbals uh, in tiger moths work. And so different um, species of tiger moths have uh, different numbers of these uh, timbals on their thorax. And um, depending on how many they have, um, they can actually make um, more sound faster. And so for Bertholdia trigona, 
it has a lot of those timbals on that structure. And so it is able to produce sound at a high frequency, a frequency that is so high that it actually um, causes a disruption to bat echolocation. There's another species, Cycnea tenera, um, who is also able to, to jam that bat sonar. And I wanna show you um, here in this video what that looks like. You could hear the bat cry uh, and then the response from the moth and the bat completely losing track of where that prey is. And there are a lot of different strategy or a lot of different hypotheses out there about the evolution of that strategy and whether or not the sound production in tiger moths is scaring the bat, um, if it's um, disorient, you know, causing disorientation, um, but the data that, you know, that we have and that has been published over the years really strongly supports um, this, this jamming theory and that um, the sound is actually jammed and the, the bat as a result cannot, um, cannot find its prey, can't locate it, which is really phenomenal. Pushing too many buttons. I just want to take a second now and kind of um, switch gears a little bit um, to talk about um, plant chemistry. Plant chemistry also plays a significant role in the tiger moth defensive system. And so um, a lot of tiger moths actually feed on on toxic plants as caterpillars. And they do that to sequester the compounds um, into adulthood and it provides some protection against predators, um, both day flying predators and night flying predators. But just to, to keep in mind, you know, that plants, um, many plants produce these metabolites to deter that herbivore feeding. And so there are, in many cases, these toxic compounds would kill something that would try to feed on it. But in the case of, of tiger moths, they really, really seek out and, and go after uh, plants that have a lot of the secondary metabolites. Specifically, pyrolizidine pyro alkaloids um, uh, is a, a metabolite that, that tiger moths um, are able to sequester um, and, um, and, and do so in actually really high quantities. Um, other insects that you know, can get away with feeding on toxic plants you know, have a way to metabolize the secondary compounds. Um, certainly tiger moths are not the only insects to sequester toxic secondary compounds. Um, other insects have figured out ways to feed in a way to avoid those compounds or feed on a, part, a different part of the plant um, to avoid that altogether. Uh, but here again, we've got Tyria jacobi. I mentioned this species earlier and its caterpillars um, feed specifically, they specialize on plants that have pyrolizidine alkaloids. Um, so in terms of the types of compounds that tiger moths um, acquire and sequester, um, PAs are a big one. Um, but also um, there are species of tiger moths that will feed on plants with cardiac glycosides and they will sequester those and use them for protection, in some cases even for mating. Um, iridoid gly glycosides are another one. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit later about um, tiger moths that actually feed on lichens. Uh, I mentioned um, that they do have that association, um, but one of the things we've discovered through um, years of research in my lab is that um, the lichen feeding tiger moths are also sequestering toxic compounds um, from the fungal partner in the lichen symbiosis um, system, which is pretty fascinating. And here uh, on the right is a picture of um, some beautiful euchromion mo tiger moths. These are, are wasp mimics and they are actually feeding on plant leaves. They are um, they are regurgitating their saliva and scratching at the tissue to try and, and make a little pyrolizidine alkaloid soup, um, which is, a, again, a, a really remarkable um, strategy in terms of adult um, feeding within, within any butterfly or moth, really. And so they do this, as I said, to collect those chemicals for defensive purposes and in some cases for mating. I'll, I'll, I'll say some, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but I wanted to show you what 
collecting these chemicals um, does for the moth. Uh, we call this pharmacophagy. These moths are doing this for defense. They're not doing it for nutrition. Um, and here uh, in, the, in the top window, uh, I'm gonna show you a video of a bat um, that is being offered a, a tiger moth that has not fed on a toxic plant. Not too sure, but eventually it's, it's ready to eat that. Um, and you can see the scales flying around. Um, clearly, this is a species that is palatable to this bat or edible. Now, if we look at a tiger moth that has fed on a plant, uh, a toxic plant, um, either as a caterpillar and or as an adult, uh, we can see what kind of protection um, that conveys. And this bat is really not having it. No, thank you. He's trying to get away, get out of there. And we've done a lot of palatability trials like this over the years where we've reared different species on different plants, toxic or not, and uh, gone through um, these, um, these feeding trials. Uh, and a lot of that work has actually uh, been performed by my postdoctoral researcher, uh, Nick Dowdy, who kindly provided these videos, which I think are very remarkable. So um, I've talked a little bit about all the different strategies that tiger moths have um, to protect themselves against predation. Um, and this is a slide that just sort of um, kind of summarizes the story. It's, it's a little more complicated than, than what we're showing here, but um, generally speaking, um, we've got species that at the larval stage are specialists on a particular um, type of toxic plant. And for tiger moths, it's, it's usually a, a, a PA or pyrolizidine alkaloid um, plant. And they feed on PAs and transfer those chemicals to the adult stage. And then in the adults, um, the males actually um, synthesize those compounds to produce um, mating pheromones. And so females uh, learn to love the mates that have the most toxic um, pheromones uh, because of course they can incorporate that uh, into, uh, into egg production and protect their babies. We also have generalist species um, that uh, feed on all kinds of different plants. They don't specialize on anything in particular. Um, they acquire PAs um, through their, their feeding on a variety of different plants. They may also feed on plants that don't have PAs. Um, and the mating system as a result um, can be just as varied uh, where you might have no male courtship or incorporation of, of compounds um, into the pheromones. You may have some uh, courtship that's actually sound product, sound um, based courtship, um, or you might have some other combination of all of those put together. Um, and then there are some other species that feed on those cardiac glycosides or other plants that don't have toxic compounds. And that's often um, where we see that adult pharmacophagy or PA feeding in the adult stages. And in Cosmosoma myrodora, uh, the males will feed on PA plants as adults, and they will use um, those compounds to make a very special shroud um, and actually um, cover it, the female with it um, after mating to protect her from any sort of predation, whether it be bats or, or birds or, or other invertebrates like spiders. So, to put all of those behaviors into sort of an evolutionary framework in the same way that we did with the fruit piercers and blood feeders in the vampire moth group, um, we set out um, kind of on the same path. We wanted to know whether or not there was a stepwise progression from um, PA feeding as larvae, whether it be sort of hit or miss PA feeding or some obligate PA feeding as we see in the specialist species. 
um, followed by then adults PA feeding. We also wanted to know, um, you know, how many origins um, of this behavior are involved. And, um, and along with that, um, we also um, had question, research questions related to how sound production might be implicated um, in these various feeding strategies. Um, because I didn't really have time to mention this, but there are um, acoustic studies that came out of Bill Connor's lab around the same time that we were working on these more plant-based um, evolutionary studies um, that demonstrated that the tiger moths um, that are toxic um, do in fact use sound production to warn bats um, that they are distasteful. And so this is all tied together in a pretty, um, a pretty phenomenal package in, in terms of the different crazy kinds of things that insects can do. So we put together another family tree. Um, uh, this one has a lot more species in it um, than uh, we, we looked at in the fruit piercing and blood feeding moth tree. Um, but basically um, what we saw when we mapped those different uh, feeding behaviors and, and um, plant associations onto this family tree for tiger moths, we found that lichen feeding actually arose early in the evolution of tiger moths. And that um, the lichen feeding tiger moths are, are really kind of, uh, there, there's a well-supported group of species that were really closely related to each other. And that's this group that you can see here in that, in that green. Followed by that, we see um, a group of, um, of primarily old world moths, um, Amarilla, there's a picture of Amarilla right here, um, that are in fact um, exhibit adult pharmacophagy. And so that too, at least one origin of that behavior arose early on um, in the evolution of tiger moths. And then what we see from there, which you can kind of kind of get the idea from these different colored dots that associate with a, a given um, behavior or association here over on the right, um, is that um, uh, specialization on PA plants by larvae uh, arose uh, a couple of different times, but relatively early on in the evolution of uh, tiger moths. And that generalist um, feeding um, arose uh, sort of after that. And you can see here, we've got a, a big group of species that have larvae that are generalist PA uh, plant feeders. And so this was um, really important and interesting because it sort of turned the idea that um, that generalist um, that generalist species uh, evolve um, into specialists. This was sort of a, a reverse situation from what you might read uh, in the textbooks, where we see um, we see the specialists evolving first and then uh, generalists. But actually, um, you know, if you dig down uh, deeply into um, some of the behaviors in these um, generalist larvae and look at some of their morphological structures, you can see that they, they do have specialized structures for uh, detecting plants that have PAs. They just um, are not as tightly associated with only plants that have those secondary metabolites. And so that in itself is a little bit of a, a specialization. So it, I guess it's all kind of uh, relative. But then here again, we see um, some additional and independent origins of that adult pharmacophagy. And so that behavior, as, um, as unique and remarkable as it may seem, is, um, is relatively common across the tiger moth tree of life, which is pretty cool. So next, we wanted to dig a little more deeply into um, this pattern of chemical sequestration in the lichen feeding tiger moths. Um, it's very interesting that anything uh, would feed on a lichen and make a living doing it. Lichens have a lot of, of secondary um, compounds. They're full of phenolics. Um, they, are, they are not um, a, a great diet, um, you know, just uh, if you think about it on the surface. Um, they're uh, difficult um, to, to, um, to move around on. Um, they often occur in harsh environments. And um, it's just a very, uh, a very tough substrate, not to mention the pool of, of compounds um, 
that um, that you find in lichens. And just to kind of refresh, um, you know, the lichen symbiosis um, involves um, a layer of, of algae or cyanobacteria uh, combined with um, fungal hyphae. There are a couple of, of lineages of, of fungi that um, we consider to be lichenized across the fungal tree of life. Um, but in short, you know, this is a symbiotic relationship between an algae most of the time and a fungus. And the algae provides nutrition um, to the, the fungal hyphae uh, via photosynthesis. And in, when talking about tiger moths, it's true that that algal layer provides nutrition uh, for that caterpillar as well. The fungus, on the other hand, with all of its the, uh, chemical composition provides uh, UV protection and other protection um, in addition to a suitable environment for that algae. So we've got the the photobiont is the algae and the mycobiont um, is the fungus. And in, in terms of tiger moths, um, you know, it's the, the algae that, um, that the caterpillars are getting nutrition from. And then when it comes to those defensive chemicals, we hypothesize it's the mycobiont that is providing, um, providing the, the chemistry. So any herbivorous uh, lichen feeder must cope with those phenolics that are produced by that fungal component. Um, there are over a thousand uh, described phenolics. And um, when it comes to the lichen feeding uh, tiger moths, uh, this, this tribe is, is called Lothosiini, by the way. Um, this is a line lineage unknown to be able to sequester those. So we're not talking about avoiding them. Uh, we're not talking about um, uh, host switching um, from you know, the algal layer to some other plant. These are obligate uh, lichen associates. And um, as I mentioned, uh, we hypothesize that these uh, species use the chemicals against predators and parasitoids in the way that their other tiger moth relatives use um, pyrolizidine and alkaloid plants. So we took a sample of species, as many species as we could get specimens for um, that were represented um, in the tiger moth tree of life that I presented earlier and added a few more through some field work. And we actually screened these specimens, many of which were um, really old museum specimens. Some of them were even 30 years old. Um, and we were able to find that every single specimen had, um, had phenolic compounds or um, a compound derived from a chemical pathway um, that is known to produce compounds like this. Um, we identified 32 different kinds of phenolics um, in these in the moths that we sam sampled, um, with some being relatively common um, and others being um, unique to a single species. We also, um, in this uh, phenolic survey, if you will, um, we had three replicates, so three individuals or biological replicates per species, just to be sure that um, we didn't have contamination or that we weren't seeing, um, you know, something wildly different from one specimen to the next. And sure enough, um, we had matching chemical profiles for, um, for most of those individuals. Certainly there would be one or two here that maybe you would see something and that wasn't in, in the other replicate. Uh, but for the most part, um, this was very consistent, uh, which was really fascinating. Um, so 10 or more phenolics identified in seven, um, in seven of the species. So some species have a lot of these chemicals. And keep in mind, it's the caterpillars that are feeding on these compounds. And we're looking at the adult stages in this chemical profile analysis. So it could even be that not all of those chemicals that they're getting as larvae are even sequestered. They, there could be more at the larval stage. And we did publish a paper um, about that a couple of years ago on just looking at one species, but it's really interesting to see how this chemical profile um, you know, can change uh, by life stage. So um, kind of following suit with what we did in the other studies that I've talked about today, um, is we put together a tree of life for just the lichen feeders um, in this case. And, um, and we mapped those chemical profiles onto that tree to determine whether or not 
um, there was any pattern. Certainly, I already talked about consistency within a biological replicate, but what about closely related species? Do they share chemical profiles? Do organisms that um, share uh, taxonomic nomenclature, which of course is based on an assumption that they're related, um, do they share chemical profiles? And um, certainly uh, we, we did find that to be true. And this is a graphic here. You're not gonna be able to, to read the tiny text, but this is a clustering analysis that, that definitely showed us that there is a pattern of sequestered lichen compounds by species. And so we did see some significant differences among, but not within the species groups that we, um, that we screened for these lichen compounds. We also, um, did a little bit of chemical pathway analysis and determined that certain larger groups of closely related moths um, that have origins uh, in different parts of, of the world um, tend to have chemical profiles that can be um, can be associated with a particular chemical pathway. And in some cases, there are groups of species that sequester compounds from just one of those chemical pathways and others that can sequester compounds produced by all three of the different chemical path pathways that we analyze. And so it's, it's really fascinating to think that not only is there consistency with the biological replicates, but that closely related species seem to be sequestering the same types of compounds from lichens and that in some cases, groups of different species um, are actually selectively sequestering sets of compounds that are produced by a given pathway. So a lot of great patterns and, and, and really interesting um, questions answered. Um, starting the study, we really had no idea. We didn't even know if it was really true that these moths fed on lichens because they're so tiny, it's almost impossible to find the caterpillars uh, in nature. Um, um, exhibiting that feeding behavior. So um, that again is, is some research that came out of my lab a couple of years ago. And so I wanted to take um, just a couple more minutes. I know we're gonna be running out of time here and, and talk about what we're doing right here, right now. Um, and that is we are continuing to build on the tree of life for tiger moths, 11,000 species. We've only sampled a couple of hundred. So we really have our work cut out for us, but we are getting there. We're developing um, new and novel um, techniques that help us build um, stronger, um, uh, more robust um, family trees that give us a lot of confidence in understanding how these species are related to each other and more confidence also in uh, the evolution of their behaviors. And so this is a, a tree that, um, that we published uh, at the beginning of 2021. Um, and, um, and we're still uh, focusing. So over here, I'll show you, I'll point out if, I, if you can see my pointer. So these are the lichen feeders over here. And we're still very heavily focused on um, better understanding um, the, the biology and, and evolution of that system. But we're also really interested in, in this group here. We're calling this the the PPCE group. And within this group are those bat jamming moths and, and, uh, and, um, and species that uh, some of which produce sound, but they only produce it for mating. Um, we're really interested in sort of focusing on, on this half of the evolutionary tree um, to better understand the sound side of the story in addition to the plant side. And this is my postdoc, Nick. I've been talking about them the, throughout this presentation. Um, nobody loves tiger moths more than Nick, not even me. And you can see here, he is at a woolly bear caterpillar festival um, and, and is so excited to have his picture taken with this woolly bear caterpillar, which woolly bears are tiger moth babies, um, mm -hmm. if you didn't know that. Um, so uh, this is Nick's project. He's um, just received some funding from the National Science Foundation to continue the work um, of looking at whether or not um, the, the structures of the sound producing organs um, are correlated with the type of sound that these species produce. So on the left, um, at the top, we've got Bertholdia trigona, our, our known jammer. And then we've got a couple of other species that he's been uh, focused on 
um, including species that, um, that produce sound um, but are not toxic. They're actually acoustic um, mimickers, which is incredible. So we call that acoustic aposematism. Um, these are copycats. They're really not toxic, but they're trying to fool a bat into thinking they are no different than the monarch viceroy um, sort of visual aposematism that we, we know um, a lot more of, about. And then we certainly do have um, species that make sound to warn bats that they're distasteful and they truly are distasteful. Those sounds um, are produced at a lower frequency. They're not produced at a frequency that's high enough to jam bat echolocation. So it doesn't exceed that jamming threshold, which is what we see here on this dotted line. So the frequency at which you make sound has to be over here in the red if you're going to disrupt echolocation. Um, other species uh, try and evade bat predation, um, you know, just by, by saying, hey, um, if you can recognize this sound that I'm producing, you're going to know that if you try to eat me, you're not going to like the way I taste. Um, and then, of course, um, there are some that are uncharacterized um, and others that are, are simply silent. And so we are working um, very closely to to sample um, more species that, um, that exhibit a, a more variation in, in terms of these different kinds of, of behaviors. And so this is um, a paper that um, Nick is, is working on uh, right now. But one thing to note um, is that there are no fewer than five independent um, gains of, uh, or origins of sonar jamming. So sonar jamming pops up in many places in this part of the tiger moth tree. It doesn't necessarily mean um, that closely related species have um, the same sound producing um, behaviors and strategies. And this is just another picture. We're very focused on, um, on trying to learn as much as we can about um, this behavior uh, and this, these anti-predator defenses. Um, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to catch the moths and the bats and get them to agree with each other you know, in the lab and in the field to do these kinds of studies. Uh, we simply don't know a lot um, about the behavior for a lot of these species. We, we don't know, we don't even have um, samples for a lot of these species because there are so many, there are thousands. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to utilize specimens in museum collections. Um, there are many of those, um, you know, in, in natural history collections around the world. Um, and we are, um, we are examining those specimens um, using different kinds of microscopy in order to determine whether or not we can predict their um, anti-predator defensive behaviors based on what their sound producing structures look like. And as you can see here, um, the variation in what these structures look like is just as great as the variation in the moths themselves. Truly remarkable. Um, we're just still working to characterize the meaning of these differences in those structures that produce sound and test how reliable they are uh, for helping us determine, in fact, uh, the, the strategy that that species is using against bats. So to conclude, uh, what have we done over, over time? Um, we've made significant progress towards resolving that tiger moth tree of life. We've tested and optimized methodology for chemical profiling, um, especially in the lichen feeding lineage. Um, we've demonstrated that certain groups of tiger moths definitely selectively sequester um, lichen compounds uh, in tiger moths, which is again, un was unknown to science before this work. We've developed and tested um, a nested enrichment probe set. So this is a, 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 a chemical kit that's designed to target certain genes within tiger moths that help us um, put together very robust family trees. So it's kind of like forensic files type stuff, um, these genealogy trees. It's a, a, a kit that is specific to tiger moths. Um, and we built that um, kit based on um, uh, genomic resources that we gathered um, for some species. And now we've designed um, uh, a tool that can be used to test on all tiger moth species. And of course, multiple independent origins of sonar jamming is, is very interesting. It's interesting that um, you know, these behaviors aren't necessarily tied uh, to 
to who you're related to in tiger moths anyway. So many other exciting discoveries we hope are along the way. Lots of people to thank um, in terms of collaborators and funding. And, um, and then I want again to thank uh, my audience this evening. And I think I've, I've taken up time, but I'm happy to stay for a couple of questions um, if folks have them. Great, well, thanks so much, Jen. Um, it's really nice to hear some in-depth details about your research and um, you know where, where our understanding might go from here. So really appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. It looks like we have one person I'm adding into the meeting. Um, we did have a few questions, but before we get going, um, if anyone has to leave right now, I want to thank you as well for attending tonight. Um, it's really great to have some familiar faces or at least names on the screen. And um, I will quickly in chat, just put some details that you can grab before you go. Um, we do have one more lecture coming through this summer. So be sure to check that out. Clearly I missed your 10 minute warning, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, we did have two questions come through on chat, so I will read those out loud for us right now. Um, Ed asked, what harmful crop damaging insects, if any, do moths consume? And is any genetic modification being done regarding moths to use them to help reduce specific harmful insects instead of using insecticides? Hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily say that we would, that I can't think of any moths that um, are going to be bio agents on other insects. Um, that being said, um, when I think about um, corn pests, um, there are, um, there are, I mean, and it's, it's kind of the reverse of what you're asking, but there, you know, are certainly strains of corn that have um, microbes um, sort of designed into um, the, the breeding of those plants that, um, that actually harm moth pests. And so that's kind of, that's a situation or a system where you've got a microbe and a plant and a, and a moth um, kind, of, kind of coming together to, um, to eliminate an insect pest in an agricultural system. Um, you know, certainly when it comes to um, moths that are pests in agriculture, um, we often, um, we often in, in biological control studies work with parasitoids. So wasp and fly um, species that actually um, are able to, um, to detect the feeding on the plant. So they, they actually, uh, when a, an herbivore is, is feeding on the leaves, um, you know, they, there's a, a chemical reaction that occurs and then the plant can release um, plant volatiles that will send a message to a wasp or a fly that can come and insert its eggs into a caterpillar as it's feeding on that plant. And then when those eggs hatch into little baby wasps and baby flies, they eat the caterpillar um, quite literally from the inside out. And so those are examples of other insects that have been brought in um, on the, you know, to, to control the moths that, that um, are pests. But is the other way around, I don't think so, but Anything's possible. Anything's possible. Great. Gruesome, but, but amazing. Yeah. Um, we had another question from Bill and it is, were there electronic copies of the sound made by moths that were reproduced to see if the electronic copies had the same effect on bats? Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's actually really fun to do. Um, <laughs> we have sound recordings um, from all kinds of moths. And, um, and actually, if you ever wanted to see this in action, you should come and join the Milwaukee Public Museum at one of our bio blitzes in the summer. Because Nick, he's my Batman, I call him my Batman. Um, he has all of this crazy um, sound recording um, um, equipment. And so he'll catch moths at the sheet and then he'll record their sounds. And then definitely you can take those sounds uh, into the lab and, um, and do playbacks. 
um, to determine what kind of uh, response the, bot, the bats are going to have to those sounds. And I think actually, um, I don't know, don't quote me on this because it's been a while, but I think some of the work that was published, it didn't come out of my lab, it came out of Bill Connor's lab, um, around the acoustic aposematism and mimicry. So, um, you know, a, a, a palatable moth species mimicking with sound, not color, an unpalatable. I think some of that work um, was done with um, electronic recordings with the bats because it's really hard, as I said, to like get all of this aligned um, and working in nature, especially if you're in at some remote, far away place. It can be really hard, and the bats have to be trained in tents before you know you conduct the studies. And um, so, certainly, that work—it's a long answer, but it's uh, it's very exciting. Uh, uh, the work that has been done um, along those lines. But yeah, Nick does that stuff on the fly, even at our BioBlitz. So it's really, really fun, really fun research. Yeah. Great. Yeah, a lot of work too. Um, it does not look like there are any new questions in chat. Um, so I might leave with one of mine. You know, you, you kind of fed into this uh, just now, Jen, but you had mentioned all the work that goes into studies like this. Um, and one question kind of for the general public might be, how could someone who is not research oriented, so in other words, just a, a regular old person, um, become involved in scientific studies and help to contribute towards a better understanding of either moths or, or the natural world in general? Sure. Uh, I like to consider myself just a regular old person, actually, um, <laughs> who really had no idea that this kind of work could even existed, let alone could become a career. And so I would say, um, you know, making sure that um, that things like this happen, where, where we have lectures and outreach and programs that that help folks, um, you know, realize that that this kind of uh, research is out there and up for grabs and, and help folks who are passionate about that prepare. You know, if that means getting an internship or, or working in a lab or, you know, taking the right classes in school. Um, uh, and, and also I would say that there are a lot of opportunities out there now for community members to engage in science um, through various uh, community and citizen science projects. Um, they're becoming um, a, a lot more accessible, I think. Um, and I know of uh, several projects like that that are already going on in the Midwest, whether you're like butterflies or birds or dragonflies. Um, of course, I know all the insect ones. I'm sure there are fish ones and mammal ones. Um, but there are um, definitely ways to, to get involved with projects like that. And I think just, um, you know, paying a visit to the museums and, and seeing what's going on and asking people, um, hey, you know, is there any, uh, any survey work that's going on in the area? I mean, we, have, we do surveys, um, you know, throughout the state of Wisconsin. And, um, and if somebody wanted to tag along and help or go on a, a community walk or hold a clipboard and help us, you know, um, observe and identify or photograph, um, you know, what we're seeing, uh, I think, you know, that's, um, that's, a, that's, those are some ways, I'm sure there are other ways as well, but just kind of getting out there, getting involved, and knowing where and who does that kind of work, and not being afraid to reach out and ask. Sure. Does that answer your question, Molly? Absolutely, yeah, and I, that was probably my way of advocating for the work that we do at museums, you know, we, we really do want to engage the public and make um, everyone feel that this, this kind of work and um, you know, diving into science is accessible and we, we welcome public engagement. So it is really important to have everyone involved in, in our learning, so. Well, and I'd also just add to that, it doesn't have to be field work either. There's a lot of community science that happens through museums and through universities and other organizations that happens virtually. There's a lot you can do online now. We have people helping us digitize our specimens in our collection just based off images that we take and post. And, and if people are interested in you know, helping us document those records and getting them into databases or 
um, figuring out latitude and longitude coordinates from a, a museum label that, you know, is 100 years old. It's like a little investigation, right? Um, so there's a lot of that kind of work that can be done um, behind the scenes, right from your own homes, too, if, if people, um, you know, maybe don't like the creepy crawlies outside as much. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, before this devolves into a conversation between the two of us, um, <laughs> I guess we can end here. Thanks, everyone, for hanging around, and thank you, Jen, for joining us.